Today, I'm going to be showing you how to build the ultimate RC aeroplane. It's going to fly up to 60 miles per hour. It can fly 13 kilometers away. We are limited in the UK by law to 400 feet or 120 meters. It's going to be digital, so the feed is high definition and it's going to have a VR type setup on here. So pan and tilt with a camera. When you move your head with the goggles, then it will move the camera very immersive. And it's going to have GPS as well. The idea is that we fly the sky like a normal airplane. But if we do get into trouble, for example, lose video, then we can hit the return to home and the thing will fly home. It's going to have the telemetry as well. So it's going to tell us how high up we are, how fast we are going, how far it is to home and things like that. And it's also very easy as well. This is the multiplex fun cub. It's kind of a intermediate plane. So uh, you still have to control it. It's going to have a flight controller in there doing all of the fun stuff with the GPS. But essentially what I like about this plane is it flies nicely without a flight controller. And then if you need the flight controller for the telemetry and hooking up everything, then it's great for that. What's also good about the Multiplex Fun Cub is that it's got a hatch at the front. That means that we can stick the camera and servos up there nicely and get a scale view. It's also got really thick wheels so that we can take off and land FPV and we can have some heavy landings. It's not going to matter. This one has got all of the stuff in, which again, is fairly simple. The only thing missing here is the wings, just so I can show it to you. We've got the motor up front then. You're given a spinner as well. It's going to be running a 13 four inch prop. Then in here, if we have a look, you get a ESC if you have the power pack version. So this is all multiplex running gear here. So you can see just a, a simple servo wire that would normally go to your receiver and that would be for the throttle. Your battery sits back there like that. So it's a, it's a big ESC, uh, three to four S. And then it's just uh, simple servos which are buried inside the body, one each side, so there. And that is for the elevator and rudder. And uh, we should somewhere have those wires. You just This is a little bit tricky to get your hand down, but basically all the wires that we need are here. Yeah, very simple, as I say. We've got elevator and rudder. And then on the wings, the ailerons are two servos, so servo for each aileron, and that goes into there. So really, all of these would just go into your receiver, and you could have it flying like that line of sight, oh, probably in, you know, about 10 minutes from uh, the position that it's in now. The only thing that it's got is a GPS, which I've added. This is the BN22. And that's just a bit of white tape. And down here, I have got the connectors that it comes with. And I've just put some pins on the end there because that's going to connect to another four pin connector and go to the flight controller. So this is the flight controller. It's the Matex Systems F405 wing. You can use other ones, but I'm very familiar with this one. And it's going to sit between our servos and also the battery for the model as well. It's mostly going to be used for its servo input. You see there aren't a lot of receivers that are cheap and have long range capabilities and are also PWM. So I like to use the Crossfire system, but Crossfire only has one eight channel PWM receiver. Whereas here we can take the really tiny micro receivers with incredible range, plug it in via SBUS, and then we can use up to nine servo ins and outs, if you will. 
so it's great for that already but then of course I can use all of the telemetry so the battery voltage from the battery so we know how much flight time we're getting uh, we can plug a GPS in there and by the way once these pins are soldered to here these are the ones that come in the package everything is just going to be plug and play and you're going to be able to take this out and uh, revert it back to you know just a, a normal simple aeroplane if you like so those are the benefits of the flight controller and of course uh, it can actually power down and power up the uh, DJI Cadex Vista um, if you are familiar with quadcopters then the Cadex Vista so the video transmitter it gets hot if it's left at running at full power but here we can disarm it and in doing that process it sets the Cadex Vista to low power so it's doing a lot of things this guy it's not doing the usual things that people use them for which is stabilization in unstable models and also uh, for beginners and, and wings people might say why don't you do a wing well I've got a wing and I just don't enjoy flying wings. Yeah, you can fly them for a long time, but you don't have the regular control surfaces of a plane. And ever since I wanted to do RC flying, I wanted it to be as realistic as possible to fly in full scale. And that's basically what this is going to be. We've got an aeroplane that's got all of the control surfaces of your you know, usual general aviation plane, such as a rudder and elevator whereas a wing it's more about you know getting the prop out of view and uh, seeing how far you can get you know we get really far with this guy uh, but that's not the original idea with it it's to have redundancy so GPS returns home but actually if we don't need it then we'll be flying the plane uh, completely in uh, manual or bypass mode so not even using any of the stabilization features on this thing so uh, the first thing that we need to do is uh, probably load iNav on it so iNav is the software it's free and uh, you have to calibrate the uh, gyro in there and if we start plugging things in uh, like for example we got to add an in and an out for an XT60 so it's probably best to flash the version of iNav which I'm familiar with I'm gonna go for 2.51 but obviously we're on version 3 now but 2.51 does everything that I want to do and more so I'm going to plug this into the USB on the computer and this is iNav you can see it says COM4 up the top there now because uh, this hasn't been used before it's uh, giving you some options here I'm just going to go with airplane but I'm going to be setting the thing up fully yeah, it's already flashed with 2.51 that's the version I'm going to go with but if we were going to be flashing it then you would type in version in here and uh, Matek F405SE so if you wanted to uh, flash it uh, you would come down here and find uh, Matek F405 SE which uh, is there Matek and then the version here you can see it's actually the last version you can actually flash to it now but you know obviously I've got uh, 3.01 I'm not gonna go for that uh, just because I, I know how this uh, version works here of uh, 2.51 and um, so if we connect to it here and just go through the calibration this is really why I plugged it into iNav before you know soldering stuff on and that is uh, we need to change the orientation uh, of the uh, of the board and uh, it's not good having like you know stuff 
For example, we need to put an XT60 in and out on here, and that'll get in the way slightly. So, um, calibrate accelerometer. Okay, so it says step one is complete. And it doesn't matter which order you do this in, by the way, as long as you get them all. So, I'm now going to turn it upside down and uh, calibrate accelerometer, now it says uh, processing upside down and uh, now it's sort of saying on the side there calibrate accelerometer and then over here that way calibrate and then that way calibrate and finally that way and calibrate. Don't have to be too accurate on this one. It says that it has finished so if we now go back to the uh, the setup there so where it says back and top left and right you can see the the image doing that and that's all I'm going to do at this point. Next I'm going to solder on the pins and uh, attach all of the stuff, like, such as solder, the XT60s on. So in order to do that, I have to remove the screws underneath. There are some standoffs and that's just to get to the back. We don't need to worry about this top plate. It doesn't have any function other than telling us what each one of the pins does so it's quite handy but if you want to lose a little bit of weight then you can take that off as well so these pins are colored for a reason black is ground red is voltage and white is any kind of signal and they are soldered up so that even if you're just you know glancing at it and plugging stuff in if you see a red black or white and are plugging it in the wrong one it is very helpful for that um, unfortunately it doesn't come with a diagram of how to solder those up in what order but there are diagrams on the internet so I'm just going to follow that I'll sort of do one of them just to show you how to do it and then I'll do the rest of them. Of course you can just put the pins in that you know you're going to be using but I'm going to put all of the pins in here because well I'm using a lot of them anyways. So these first five here are signal wires so I'm going to count five off one two three four five and then you just get some cutters. I'm sure you could just break them off, you know, by twisting them. They do give you more than you need, uh, but I'm just using cutters here. Then I can place those in the top, like so. Then turn it over, and I can see the pins coming out the other end. We're just going to take some 6040 leaded solder and I've got my soldering iron. This is a Hakko soldering iron and then just going to dab some solder on the pins sticking through and uh, you can use this if you like to see at the end uh, which order and what colours to put on. It doesn't really matter but I found that it helps. Okay, first one done, lots more to go. Okay, here is the finished soldering for the pins. You will note just these two here. This board is actually designed for two motors. So I'll be taking the ESC from the plane and that will have the control for the throttle. I won't need the back from 
the ESC to power anything up so I can remove that one and we've just got signal and ground there and then I guess if you've got another motor then you know you've got another signal and ground there so the channels you can see here actually start at 3 because that's 1, 2, 3 all the way up to 8 and there is a, a ninth one it, it's on a pad underneath this thing so you'd have to power that separately but what's good about this guy is that it's got multiple becks built into it so 6 volt beck for your servos that's powering those up there and then we've got a 9 volt beck which is going to be great for powering up the Cadex Vista and uh, you know various uh, 5 volts there and you can see that we've got different voltages along here as well uh, 4.5 for SBUS 5 volt along here it's a great flight controller this one but uh, still using the old USB unfortunately not uh, USB-C uh, so I'm going to be putting the bottom plate on but this top plate has got to come off because where it says ESC there that's going to be the 3 to 6S uh, LiPo for the battery and then this is going to be for the uh, ESC which is going to be a bypass on this so the ESC at the moment on the plane has currently got an XT60 it's literally going to be battery in there and then ESC plugged into there so there's no sort of destruction happening I can put the plane all back to normal if I wish to off comes the top it's just these Phillips screws and I think we may have some o-rings underneath as well okay so that should just lift off there and uh, we do have these o-rings so I'll just get rid of those for now because uh, I need to turn up these pads here So I've made up these XT60 leads here. You can buy them as a lead, but I wanted this one extra long because that's going to go to the model's battery at the front. So this is going to sit at the back of the model. That's going to get soldered on these first two pads. Then I've made up another connector, uh, different mating on that side and uh, that is going to uh, go on there oh your soldering's rubbish you won't try and do soldering whilst also filming it's really difficult there's a bit of a camera in the way you know so it should look something like that you can do a better soldering job without a camera in your face um what i am going to have to do is change the board orientation and i enough because my ESC is on that side and the arrow on this guy on the top plate is that way so just to make it feed easier I can change the orientation and I know not a problem all right let's uh, get the top back on this guy so this next part is kind of the easiest part because it's just plugging in the cables now to our devices and as everything's on solder pins uh, it's going to be easy now some people say oh it's you know the connectors will come out of the solder pins too easily well I've not found that so um, the first thing I'm going to connect here is channels uh, 7 and 8 these are just uh, servo extensions and that's because the head tracker works on the pan and tilt servo on channels 7 and 8 it's wireless head tracking uh, so uh, no cables except the one to power up uh, your goggles but you can you know use just a normal head tracker and power uh, that is fine so that's the extensions uh, they got you can't quite see but different colors on the end of them that's got like an orange one on it's just so that when connecting it up to the head tracker it's uh, easily found 
And then the next one is going to be uh, Esbus. And it's labelled again. This is just a, a little tiny sort of pigtail connector. That's going to plug into a crossfire receiver which I've already attached to the plane via the antenna. So that's just going to slot in there. Again, white being the signal and then middle red being voltage. I think it says 4.5 volts. Use an S bus because well, we you know, don't really need uh, all of the telemetry and complications uh, of CRSF. We also don't need the latency and uh, in order to get 12 channels out of crossfire um, you're going to have reduced latency anyway so because you've got either 8 or 12 12 is going to be fine and the latency is going to be absolutely fine then I have made up this cable here which I'll explain in a second but this is going to be doing the TX and RX and also the ground for the Cadex Vista so that's on T5 and R5 and then I've got this uh, JST connector here with a space in and that's going to be ground and 9 volt. Yes, these uh, little JST connectors, they fit on the pins nicely. Then just cable tied those two along there. It's uh, quite a long cable. Uh, so we have got the opposite connector there and I've also got um, the reverse of those connectors on the Cadex Vista so that's doing power and uh, that's doing TX, RX and ground so that uh, we can have all of the telemetry going over the uh, UART 5 or T5 and R5 um, the last thing to do is to just connect the GPS cable and then uh, we're going to go into iNav and set all of these up to match but uh, we're almost done here which is great isn't it? So for the GPS I'm using extension cable again and uh, this one is uh, straightforward again so it's ground and then 5 volt and then it's going to be uh, yeah TX and your RX, of course that will have to mate up to the GPS uh, that I showed you earlier on the plane, that will just plug in there and uh, yeah, it's uh, that's all the connections, looks a bit messy, um, also going to be using uh, dual lock pads on the bottom uh, that will secure it to the plane but also mean that we can take it off if uh, I need to. So just peel back the dual lock and then place this underneath. Some people like to use uh, double sided tape or whatever, that's fine. It's just I like to be able to take it out of the model and uh, that just sits underneath and then we'll lock into place in, in the model. Okay, so let's take a look at the iNav setup. I've already done it, but I will take you through all of the important things. We've done the calibration, so if we go on to the mixer, I've got airplane selected here, and if we take a look, I've got my servo mixer down here. And this is basically going to say, okay, what channels are going to do what? So we know that one is taken up with the motor so that's uh, channel one and then two is the second motor which I'm not using so servo three I actually got as roll or aileron so it's a stabilized roll that's just what it's going to do when no mode is selected it's kind of like an acro mode so it's not full manual um, but we just want stabilized roll here. It, it sets it up as stabilized. So I'm going to be doing my uh, T A E R. So that's uh, throttle ailerons elevator rudder. So ailerons is roll. So T throttle T A for aileron. So servo three, servo four, the one next to it. It's going to be pitch T A E E for elevator and R, or your as it is in here, R for rudder, so 3, 4, 5, those are going to be 
my servo outputs for the control and then motor one. Then uh, seven, eight and six, if they're in that order, uh, I'll tell you why. So seven is going to be for either pan or tilt and eight is also for pan and tilt and here rather than adding anything into the sort of flight controller bit we're completely bypassing it so whatever comes through on channel 7 is going to put channel 7 through uh, the servo on 7 and uh, same for 8 so directly through there. 6 this is down here because um, I'm working on a smoke system so that triggers on six so you know if I'd done it in order you know six would have been in here doesn't matter of the order so on the outputs that's just going to show you the live outputs uh, you need to enable motor and servo output when you are finished they recommend having this off while everything is uh, plugged in but of course you need to turn this on afterwards otherwise uh, the thing won't arm. So ESC protocol uh, you've got all of these I just left it as standard doesn't matter with a plane I think all came as standard like this and works. Presets we're not using. Ports so this is an important one I've got uh, SBUS here on the UART2 so that's where SBUS lies then uh, we plugged in on UART5 the DJI FPV VTX so that's there and then a GPS over here as well that's the BN220 on the sensors and uh, the board rate there just uh, leaving it at that number everything else uh, isn't in use there so under configuration I don't think I touched much here either um, but you can take a, a look at it one thing I did change was the GPS protocol to U-Block 7. I get way quicker satellites and way more satellites on U-Block uh, 7. Um, and I've got this set to European, of course. That's, you know, you have to uh, check out uh, what is the best for your country. Um, usually it's like U-Blocks, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, U-Block 7. Uh, gives me more and then you, like, you've got North American and stuff uh, as well. I didn't have it on auto detect uh, and uh, we're not going to be flying outside of Europe so I've got it set as that. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Stop motors on low throttle. This is something that just, I like from flying planes obviously. Uh, it's kind of like motor stop. Um, so if you've got that on and you go to zero throttle then it will stop the propellers. Uh, I guess on a quadcopter, you know, uh, you want them to keep going, sort of like an idle up type thing. Uh, telemetry output, I'm not using that, but I, I've got it turned on. Um, enable uh, motor and servo output. On screen display, I'm going to be using and uh, permanently enable air mode. Uh, they recommend you to do that. Um, I think it does something uh, differently. Uh, with iNav, but um, I've got that turned on anyways. So fail safe, uh, set to return to home because um, we've got GPS obviously, um, so that's fairly straightforward. Pit tuning, uh, I didn't touch at all. Uh, they recommend that you turn feed forward to zero. Uh, you're having problems with the rudder, but uh, I've had no problems so. Uh, leaving that there. I'm just trying to see if there's anything else I changed here. Um, those are my rates, so roll rate and all that. It doesn't really matter because we're, I'm going to be bypassing this. We're going to be in manual mode anyway, so uh, this only um, is going to be in use when doing like return to home and loiter. I don't think I touched any of that in there. Um, advanced tuning again. Don't think I touched anything in there, um, but that is my settings. Nothing in programming. Oh, one thing that you need to do, actually, I missed it, is if you need to reverse anything, you're going to want to do it in iNav. You don't want to reverse it in your transmitter because it's going to react, like, let's say, return to home or whatever, whatever's in iNav. So if you are 
uh, flying like the reverse on your transmitter, then um, it's it's going to get that wrong. So make sure all your reversals are done here in iNav. Uh, yes, yeah, so there was nothing on programming. Uh, receiver, uh, TA. ER, as I said, I've got the RSSI feeding through from Crossfire to channel 12. As I say, I'm running Crossfire uh, as a 12 channel rather than 8. Uh, the modes, I've got uh, channel 5 for arming, which you won't be able to do until you've got a 3D fix. I think it's 6 satellites you need, but I usually get up to 14, something like that with this setup. It's really good. Um, so yeah, you'll have your controls if you don't arm, um, but uh, remember the uh, Vista VTX will be on low power so you'll need to arm to get that and it'll only do so when you've got enough satellites. Um, I've got everything else on channel 6 and that is because so we've got um, here in the middle position on my switch we've got uh, altitude hold so speaks for itself but then position hold that's like loiter it flies around in a, a big circle pretty much um, so I've got those two on at the same time we want altitude hold and uh, position hold uh, at the same time for loiter and then return to home um, it's going to climb to a, a specified amount anyways um, but again I've got loiter there return to home there same switch and down here manual manual is a complete bypass of everything if you just left it you would have uh, what they call acro which is still like kind of using the pids and and stuff like that useful for some things like small aircraft but we're trying to fly this thing uh, like you know full-size aircraft so uh, not going to be using the flight controller to actually fly the thing uh, you know, we're just going to rely on return to home if we lose our video or position hold if we need to adjust our goggles or something like that. So, um, actually, haven't got a beeper on this. I need to because there's a, a little uh, pin for a beeper, um, but I haven't done that yet. Um, it's probably best to do that um, if flying out far. So, uh, we're not going to have anything on GPS here uh, because the GPS isn't plugged in at the moment, but. Um, if you're doing this, then your GPS it, it should uh, light up there, but uh, I need to plug it in. It, it's on the plane. Um, the last thing really is the on-screen display. I've got it like quite minimalistic. Number of satellites, RSSI, the mode, uh, and then we have got the altitude, which is important. Uh, I think, um, let's see what else we have got. It's down here, isn't it? So yeah, one is the speed. Speed, I think that's that one, and then uh, distance to home uh, is there, and then direction. All of those work with uh, DJI system. Of course, the DVR doesn't record it, but uh, still, really useful information. Way better than having nothing, especially for head tracking. You know, you, you can monitor your battery. Your battery, most important one, and RSSI, very important one as well. Um, there's a, a few other things as well that I've put in the CLI that aren't options. So if we take a look at those, um, this is like recommended on the forums and by people like Painless360. So set max angle inclination roll at 600. Uh, set small angle 180. We know that one from uh, beta flight uh, basically means that it will arm regardless of the angle of the model. Uh, set uh, nav return to home allow landing never so we don't want it to land you know uh, that'll be a catastrophe I'm watching it land on its own it'll be crash land in that one uh, return to home climb first on and then the uh, altitude think that is in centimeters fail safe throttle low delay zero um, I nav reset home uh, you don't want it to do it. So basically, we've got an arm switch. Um, each time you arm it, um, it will like re-register as being home. So uh, this stops it from doing that. It's in case you like disarm in air and then rearm. Uh, it'll still return to home uh, at the first arm. So that's a good one. 
Uh, extra arming safety, uh, again, that's just, I read somewhere, that's a good thing to have. Uh, and also, uh, loiter, you can use the yaw to change the direction of the loiter. And this is quite an important one, uh, especially for the fun cub. Uh, loiter radius, it's also in, it's in centimeters. And uh, one thing um, that you are meant to do as well is have a slight inclination uh, on your uh, pitch uh, by I think is it four to five degrees so yeah you can see in the configuration I've got four degrees on the pitch and I've also changed the yaw to 180 that's because I want to to have the board sitting backwards but uh, that is everything in INAV in order to do head tracking pan and tilt on an RC model we need servos to change the angle of the pan and tilt and the problem with that is we need to use these micro servers because our FPV system is already going to be taking up a little bit of weight and we want it to weigh as least as possible now if you've got a bigger model then that's fine because you can get larger sail winch servos that have what are called one turn or, or two turn. There is a sail winch servo out there. It is too big for what we need, uh, specifically on the pan axis. So most servos only have 90 degrees of tilt, uh, which is no good for pan and tilt if you want to look out of the side of your model. This servo here, and there's a, a few special servos that do uh, 180 degrees, so Turnergy RS. 180 um, that's enough for FPV but if you want to look behind yourself then uh, we're a bit stuck other than this modification which I'm going to show you so this servo is called the PDI 9180 MG MG stands for Metal Gear and it's a 180 degree servo as it is but all we need to do is add two resistors so this is what I've got here it's off eBay so very cheap it is a 2k ohm 1 8 watt resistor so it's really small you can use bigger ones but uh, any uh, larger than 1 8 watt and you might struggle to fit it in there but the the 2k ohm is the important value and uh, this sounds and looks much more scary than it is but it's dead easy you can get this servo off Banggood really cheap. I'm going to take a screwdriver and we are just going to undo the screws underneath. Uh, be careful here that the top part uh, doesn't come loose. Uh, we just want to get in the bottom part. Okay, that's all of those screws undone. So we're just going to lift this up out of place here and we can put that to one side so those screws do go all the way through to this top part here um, but we're not really looking to take the top part off you see this green thing here this is the potentiometer and on the black wire and the white wire that is where we're going to add one of these resistors you just have to be able to get this out and sometimes it's a little bit difficult because oh, there we go it's clipped in from the other side so you can push it from the other side but I wouldn't recommend doing that because then you know all of the cogs come loose so I'm just going to with a soldering iron desolder the black and uh, desolder the white these are not silicon wires so be careful because they will burn easily so those two come off like so we're then going to take one of these resistors and i'm just going to cut short with a pair of cutters one end and leave the other end a little bit longer that's just so uh, it's going to be easier to solder and attach to so first job is to tin up this side you might want to use some uh, blue tack I don't have any to hand then I'm going to solder this onto this little tab you have to be uh, very careful because it's plastic uh, so we don't want to melt the potentiometer but I want a good 
solder joy in it. So now I can cut this one and we're going to tin it up. Okay, so I'm going to do that for the other side. It's much easier to do a neater soldering job when you haven't got a camera in front of your face. Uh, but there's your two resistors and then bend them back. And that's it. Uh, a little bit fiddly, but uh, other than that, it's uh, pretty straightforward. So this now has to go back in here. You could put some heat shrink on there if you like to stop things catching, but uh, I haven't found that to be a problem. Uh, it does clip in to the potentiometer in the center, so you might just have to get a screwdriver in there. Yeah, and you might feel like a clunk as it goes in. There we go. Uh, I think that is in. Let's just check. So we're looking for the metal pin in the middle. Uh, let's see if I can bend these down even more. We don't want anything to short. Uh, it should be okay because we've got these wires that sort of sit in the way there. So yeah, the, the actual controller board isn't going to get in the way. Okay, there we go. Uh, a lot of that box on the top sits in the bottom of the servo anyways. So uh, just to tighten these uh, screws up. So if I now take this servo head and just place it loosely on the top, this is the problem with servos, you can't get them exactly upright, but there we go, yeah you've got these splines so you can't direct them exactly, but uh, I'm going to take the servo tester, you don't need a servo tester. Uh, but if I stick it in auto, that's going to show the, the full swing of the movement that we've now got you can see that it's it's not 360 degrees but it's almost there and then if I stick it in uh, manual mode you'll see that as I twist this here we've got all that movement but what will happen is as I get to the edge of here it will go all the way around you see that so we need to set the maximum PWM values in OpenTX, but that's fine. You can see just as it gets to the bottom there, it's just going all the way around out there. So, yeah, we end up with about 300 to 270 degrees of movement. It's ready to go on your pan tilt system. Now it's time to build up the pan and tilt system. This is just a cheap one from Hobby King. You can 3D print your own these days, but what's good about this one is it's cheap. There's even cheaper copies of it out there, but more specifically is that this one kind of reaches out rather than sat on top of each other. And that's good because our foam plane is wide. So if our pan and tilt system just sat on top of each other, then we won't be able to look over the side. This one, you can do that. So I'm going to take the modified servo that gives us about 300 degrees of panning and that came with these little tiny screws so that just screws in here and then the other end I've kind of pre-built up already so this is going to sit on top of here it uses the servo arm that comes with the servo and something that is key to having uh, the least amount of movement with this guy is using these little screws here I do one one side and one the other and that stops any movement from this servo arm here now to center it you can use a like servo tester. I've already centered this one, but they have centering options on there. 
Now because this is a modified servo, um, the center is just slightly off center to give the full direction so I can correct for that in the transmitter but I've already got this centered to where I want it and you can see this is the arm from the second servo that is going to go in and that's one of these 180 degree Turnergy servos doesn't really need to be a 180 degree servo on the tilt because it's going to have a limited amount of movement on the tilt anyways by this plastic part but that's what I'm going to use and again use the servo arm that comes in the box with that servo and used two screws again because it doesn't actually quite fit but that will mean we won't get any movement from this plastic part um, I'm having it so the servo part sits at the back and that's just so that we've got a further back view of the cockpit and that should just place on here like so and you should see if I plug the servo tester in okay that we should get the desired movement which is about there you see it goes all the way around if I go too far we can limit the percentage of that uh, in OpenTX but we really want it to be going all the way around at about the same point which it kind of does like about there so that's cool yeah, a little bit of messing around to set it up but the next thing is to stick the screw that comes with the servo in the center so this next part to go on has been modified by my friend Phil we've got a little aluminium bracket for the DJI camera uh, it does come with two holes there to fit a camera this is gonna push it out like I say over the foam that fits in here and a, a servo sits on the top there so that's going to be this servo here and again we get uh, two screws I think these actually came in the kit but if not the screws that come with the servo will fit anyways so those two screw in to there like that and I'm just gonna put it in the neutral position like that and now I disconnect it and I'm going to connect this up as near as I can so that it's in the middle and uh, that should just push on to the servo there oh, looks about right so then there's a big old screw that goes in that side it might be worth leaving this screw off for when we're trying to get the settings right for this servo but really that should be in the center we can correct it with like fine adjustments in the transmitter so that needs a screw going through the center as well okay let's plug this into the servo tester and uh, let's see if we've got full movement full movement down ah, but not full movement up that must mean that something's a bit too tight on the servo let's uh, oh yeah I've done that a bit too tight I think let's try undo that and undo this a little bit fully down ah there we go that's got it fall down and fall up and then in the center yeah that's that's pretty good this canopy was made by my friend Phil out of light three millimeter ply uh, painted black 
This is for the pan and tilt to sit on and then the Cadex Vista sits on here. We've got a hole for the Vista wires and a hole for the server wires. This is for the Cadex Vista antenna. It's just a bit of wood and then two RC control snakes with some screws on the top and then this is the original Cadex Vista antenna holder. Pretty simple, does the job. Got two screws in the side here and uh, that is for rubber bands to go around so it can be secured down. We've got some support there which just sort of slots it into the aircraft at the back there and a couple of holes here as well for cable ties so that there isn't any tugging on the Cadex Vista. I've already soldered up the Cadex Vista, it's a little tricky to do but we have got a servo connector for the TX, RX and ground. There's an extra ground there, you don't need it but you know it's there so I, I soldered it up. And uh, a JST connector for the positive and the negative so it's going to connect into the flight controller. Just the standard Cadex Vista antenna. This is the 12 centimeter loom, so not the 20 centimeter one. And the original DJI camera. So we're going to be using these self tapping screws into the light ply here. And uh, the Cadex Vista is going to sit up there so it gets nice airflow from the propeller and is out of the way of the pan tilt system but at the same time sort of you know being able to not put any tension on this wire here because that wouldn't be very good so I'm gonna stick these cables through this hole here and I'm gonna mount the Cadex Vista first just because it can get in the way of the pan tilt system so I want to make sure that this is on first so that you know I don't have an issue with the pan and tilt system getting in the way and having to undo it all make sure everything is as straight as it can be and then just screw this into the wood yeah. You should be able to feel some tension. Okay, that's in there nicely, but you know, if we have a crash, it should rip out. And then this just sort of slides in through the wire there and just screws back on top. Pretty simple solution. I really like it. So, my friend Phil that came up with this. I cannot take credit for it but just so simple and using these snakes there's some flex in them so if the model tips over then these snakes just bend and then bend back so really nice simple solution for the antenna old school craft I would say I would never have thought of something like this myself just so simple so Phil has very kindly drawn a line here for me to say that your pan and tilt system can't go back any further than that but also this is the center so this one again is self tapping screws and we want to make sure I want that to go as far back but we don't want this bit here to catch the Cadex Vista so I'm gonna line all of this up off camera and it's just self tapping screws here but I don't want to get it out of line it needs to be as central as possible so I'm gonna do that off camera and show you the result after okay so the pan and tilt servo is in place as central as possible I've attached the camera up front and something important is make sure that the servo wires come out the opposite side to the Vista cable and it nicely sort of 
naturally curls this way so we'll have the full movement without any wear or anything touching the cable you can see that just about misses but at the same time kind of like hangs over the edge and there is minimal play in this thing you know just a little bit it can't be helped so if there is vibrations from the prop you can you can get rid of vibrations completely by balancing the prop um, unfortunately the prop that I had that was perfectly balanced uh, got smashed in a crash so um have to see uh what the vibrations are like from this one. Oh yeah the cable tie pretty important in a crash as well just gives it a little bit of slack on the wires there so it doesn't rip the solder pads off the vista but it's ready to go on the model and to be connected up to the flight controller I'm going to be showing you how to add a wireless head tracker to the DJI FPV goggles. The idea is that you can power up both the goggles and the head tracker using a single battery, in this case up to a 4S LiPo. There's no need for any wires going to your transmitter because it's utilizing the FR Sky Parrot Wireless Trainer. but more on that later because you don't necessarily need that for this to work. It's also utilizing the British Drone Industries Digi Adapter which costs about 40 GBP and it's a non-destructive way to add an analog module so it's literally just these two screws here and it bolts on the front so it doesn't mess up your warranty or anything like that. And this modification is using the two pins to power up one of these it is an Arduino Nano 33 BLE board the non-sense version costs about 25 GBP and you will also need one of these this is a 6 millimeter by 6 millimeter button now the sense version of the Nano 33 BLE board has a sensor that essentially lets you wave your hand in front of it and it will reset the center position of your head tracker. However, I don't think that is a good setup because once you have centered your head track, you don't really need to do it again. You need to do it every flight, but once it's set, then I wouldn't trust anybody or even myself accidentally waving my hand in front of it. Also, this board is going to sit in that way, so a button is just going to be better because then that can sit flat against this 3D printed part here. So, the 3D printed part is something that I have remixed from a chap on Thingiverse called Andy Albeit 90 so I've remixed it to make these clips more robust so that it fits tighter in here. I mean, this is quite tricky to get out here. And I've also added this flush 6mm by 6mm hole for this button here. I've also made it so that the board, this is a prototype one, clips in really tight. However, you will need some double-sided tape on there very thin just to keep it in place. I'll put a link in the video description if you want to print this off yourself and if you haven't got a 3D printer then you can use a service like 3D hubs or something like that. It's printed out of PLA and it doesn't need any supports or anything like that. Very simple just prints straight up like that. It takes about 50 minutes and I think the density was like a hundred percent. Now pretty much the only reason to buy an FR Sky radio these days is because it has the power wireless system in it or if you like the access stuff which I don't in particular. However if you own a Radio Master TX16S which a lot of people do it doesn't come with the power wireless system installed into it but because the Radio Master is based 
on the Horus. It has the solder pads and the ability to install the Power Wireless Bluetooth module into it. I'll show you a picture of that. And then you need to make sure that you flash your Radio Master with the Bluetooth option ticked and then it will work. So if we go into the menu here on this X90 2019 Tyrannis, then this is in the Goldilocks zone where it supported multi-modules and multi-protocols and uh, Crossfire as well. So I'm not using the Radio Master, but I confirm that does work. Uh, so once you have updated your Radio Master to have Bluetooth, you can go over to where it says Hardware, and then there will be a Bluetooth option, which probably blank. You can change that to Trainer, and then you should have a local address if your Bluetooth install has worked correctly. Then there is a project on GitHub by a chap called Cliff and what he has done is he has made a GUI specifically for this Arduino board. So you can go on to GitHub here and also donate to Cliff as well. I suggest that you do because this is a fantastic thing that he has done here. There's no flashing Arduino or anything like that. You just download the GUI and it ends up here. And it's a very simple GUI as well. So if I plug the Arduino nano board into a USB port on the computer and what we need to do is double press the white button and that sends it into DFU mode. Okay, so if I now go to firmware and upload firmware, we've got these options here. We want the version that is the non-Para Master. So Para Master is for when you want to take one of these and put it on the other end of your radio, you know, using a barrel connector and then it can speak wirelessly that way if you don't want to install the para wireless system from FR Sky. but I recommend that you do because it's a much neater way with having one of these on the other end of your transmitter you have to plug it into the trainer port and uh, it's just a, a more messy solution. You could build it internally but personally I would go with the FR Sky module if your radio supports it and the Radio Master TX16S, very popular radio. So we want to flash this version here. This is the latest version. So I need to refresh the COM port. There we go. It says COM12 and then upload selected and then we should get some stuff happening here. Okay, that has programmed successfully so now if I close this one here and go to refresh because it should have come out of DFU mode we've got a different COM port now and I can connect to it there we go and if I move it around like this you should see that the tilt, roll and pan is working. So the next thing we need to do is turn on Bluetooth and we can save to NVM. One of the things that makes this board so great for being a head tracker is the fact that it's got a built-in compass or magnetometer and that stops any drift when it's being used as a head tracker but like any drone that's got a built-in compass it needs to calibrate an offset for any local magnetic interference so it doesn't mess up the numbers and you need to calibrate the one in this board as well so in order to do that we go into the GUI and press calibrate and we need to put it on a flat surface and not touch it at all and we're looking for these blue values to settle down so if we just give that a second and then press next and now I'm just going to lift it up slightly and we're going to move it on all axes making sure that it doesn't really go out of the frame here because you can see that we are trying to get less than 4% wobble currently 13 
less than 4.5% variance, less than 15% gaps, and less than 5% fit error. And we should end up with a circle or sphere once it's complete. You can see that at the moment it won't let me press save because it's not got enough detection points, or should I say that it's not got low enough values here. And you might find that you have done this for a while and you can't get the variance any lower and that's because that you've moved away too much and you'll have to repeat it again. And I've done this a, a few times myself. Sometimes it can get it pretty quickly and other times it takes a while. So I will skip on to the point where all of these values are low enough that it will let me press save. Okay, that has done that. You can see I can press save. It did take a couple of goes that. Next, you're gonna to want to solder two wires. So one to the switch here and one to the switch here for the reset button. Now, this switch here, I will show you, it's connected up in a way that when it's in that position, so the legs are coming out here, then this one and this one are connected and this one and this one are connected. Now we're wanting to make a switch there, so we want to solder either that one and the bottom one or the top one and the bottom one. I have gone for this one here and that one there. It doesn't matter on the colour and then that will make a connection for the switch. Then you're going to need two wires here for your voltage and your ground. This will take up to 20 volts but my V1 DJI goggles only take up to a 4S anyway so I'm going to be using a 4S LiPo. On the end of here I have soldered them to these row of pins that actually come with the Arduino board and then that is going to plug into the pins on the FPV goggles. Now I don't want to plug them in the wrong way so what I've done is I, I know that the bottom pin is voltage in and the third pin is ground. Now you could have all of the pins here but the problem that you have if you use these pins as something shorting on the board here. So I've used four pins and I know that this one is always the bottom. I'm probably going to keep it in my goggles anyways. And what I've done is I've cut all of the pins really short and then I have covered this in epoxy as well. And I've also epoxied in the switch. So that's in there nicely. So we won't have any shorting anyway. You can use liquid electrical tape to do the same thing. And that's pretty much it. You know, we don't need a barrel connector or anything like that because everything is wireless. So if I grab my goggles here, put these pins in here, and then push this in. Now I've made it so it is really tight fitting. So it's going to take quite a bit of pressing down, but there we go, and it is in. So now it will just power directly off a 4S LiPo. But before we do that, I'm going to show you how I have set it up again in the GUI. So here we are back in the GUI, and you can see if I pan, then the pan moves. If I tilt, the tilt moves. And if I press the reset button, the pan resets and everything resets. You don't need to change the board rotation, at least I didn't, even though it's in this upright axis here. Pressing the button uh, resets that. I've got roll turned off, not using roll tend to find that you don't need roll, it doesn't break immersion, yet when you're viewing back the camera is always nice and level if you don't have the roll. You need another servo for roll as well, but I've got channel 7 on tilt 
and channel 8 on pan. My gains I've got set to 80 on the pan. It's important to get the gain right because that's how you get your sort of one-to-one -one feel and you can mess around with that. For my head tracking pan and tilt system, 80 on the pan is working and then 115 on the tilt. What you find is if you go past the upward position, the servo will reset if your gain is too high because it thinks that you have gone all the way around and back down like that. So that gain is working for me. You can reverse the direction here, but I think I might have done that in iNav. But if you're not using iNav, then you can do that here. I love this GUI. It is really simple, much easier than the Open Head Tracker project that Quantum took advantage of with their system. Okay, so if I go into my model now and page over to where it says Master Bluetooth, I'm just going to clear it because I've already done this, you'll have this option here that says discover. So if I press discover, you should just get the one code up, but mine's going to bring up a couple because you know, I've been practicing with this. I think it's the bottom one that I need to go off. And if I page then over to my mixes on channel seven and channel eight, you can see there that the source is trainer seven. And we can have that on a switch so that when it's in the middle position, the head tracker is on. And when it's in the top position, it is off. So it's like a, a reset switch. And then you do the same for channel eight. So that's your pan and tilt in. If we just move over to the output, just got a little bit of an offset for the center servo so that it remains in the center when the switch is in the up position. But now if I page over to the channels monitor and move this button to the center, which it already is, if I move the goggles around, you can see that that is outputting a pan and a tilt to channels seven and eight, which will then send that through Crossfire to iNav. But if you're sending this just directly to a receiver, then that will just output to your pan and tilt servos. But if you've got iNav, you will have to add them as a mix, but that is just really easy. All right, this is always a fun one to sort out. So we have got the bottom of the aircraft there and this is my crossfire receiver poking out the back and the antenna so what I have done is I have got the rudder servo connector so that's going to go T A E R so that's on this particular one here making sure that I've got the pins the right way around then E for elevator it's gonna go into that one next and the ailerons I've got an extension cable here again just make sure you got it the right way around uh, that one's a little bit trickier going in there we go that splits off to two for the two servos of the ailerons the last thing to do this is the throttle here and we need to go ground and signal so I'm going to have to swap around the ground and the voltage. We're not going to be using the voltage, but the way that I've got this on here is ground and signal. We don't need the back on here, so I'm just going to lift this pad up. Okay, so the grounds come out. That can sit there next to the signal. Press that down. The voltage isn't going to be on any kind of pin. 
so that can just sit next to it dormant and that's everything apart from the GPS which is up here I'm gonna have to sort that but we've got an extension cable for the GPS to come up the top here and slot into there you might be able to see inside some dual lock for the flight controller to sit on in there already all of that has got to go up that hole just moving the cables forward that need to go forward for the head tracking and Vista up front. Pile this through the hole first. Oh, it's so messy. It's like spaghetti. It does go in, I promise you. And it comes out for maintenance as well. Okay, so all of that is in there. Nice and secure on the dual lock. I've got my aileron leads coming out of the top. I've got my connection to the GPS, which is just here. And then all of the leads for the head tracker and the Vista up front. I do need to connect the receiver which I've put an extension on it just so that I can tuck it away because there's not much length there so that's what I'm going to do now. So that goes ground, 5 volt and signal for SBUS which is in that way. Got just the Immortal T antenna taped to the bottom should give us more than enough range and then this can get tucked inside or you can pull it out to bind to it if you need to but uh, this time I'm already bound. So I've updated the firmware on this and uh, if we go to the number of channels it's selected as 12 so we can get all of these channels here as I explained before. To me this is the best way of getting 12 channels out of the Crossfire without having to buy one of their very expensive standalone PWM receivers. Okay time to connect the GPS connectors. So we've got ground, voltage, TX and RX. Let's go for the ground one first and then the voltage. So RX wants to go into TX which is that next one along like that and TX wants to go in RX and I'll just do a test in INAV to make sure that we are getting everything right and then I'm going to put some tape around there because that is not a good connection. Well everything is looking good out of that so I'm just going to tape it up in place to make sure that nothing can come apart because that would be awful and then that can tuck down there as it was out of the way of the wing and now what I can do is power it up I'm using a, a Lion pack with XT30 adapter not got anything connected such as the Vista or the pan and tilt this is uh, just the throttle, the tail plane and the GPS that should hopefully boot up. We've got some noises. A light on the GPS is always good news. So I should be able to move the tail plane uh, with the controllers up down, left and right, that is all fine, and I just need to make sure that it gets enough satellites, 
uh, so that it can arm. It's not going to do that in here. Uh, but what I am going to do is uh, connect the Vista and, and all of the head tracking and stuff and, uh, and see if we can get a response. Okay, so the moment of truth for the head tracking unit. We've got the two servos going to channels 7 and 8. We have got power to the Vista and we have got telemetry to the Vista. Still got the camera protector on at the moment. Got my goggles here with the wireless head tracker. So that is paired up with my FR Sky uh, X9D access version, the 2019 version. Uh, so let's boot up the goggles which will power up the Bluetooth and head tracking module here. And then, time to plug in the model's battery and we should be able to get a demo down here. Okay, so that's it centered. That's not bad actually. Yeah, maybe the camera just needs lifting up. So that's the center position. Uh, I can just adjust the uh, central point so that it is straighter. Yeah, that looks better. It's only by a, a, a tiny amount there. And uh, the adjustment 19.5 on the tilt was from before. But uh, let's see if we are getting the uh, full axis. So I'm going to uh, reset the head tracker. And that should be up down all the way across and all the way across that way okay so something else you're gonna want to do is um, if we go into the I think it's the mixer page potentially, yeah, mixer. So, got my arm mode there. Then that's the mode switch for going between manual and then loiter and return to home. Then here you can see we've got different weights. Uh, this is because I've done it before. So a weight of 100 on the tilt. What we don't want is for the servo to burn out. So if I bring that weight from 100 down to, I don't know, let's say 60, en enable head tracking. And uh, what that should do is that's, that's limiting the servo. Uh, so that it doesn't it doesn't burn out, but I want that that full movement So I want to find out when that stops. So let's just Go up and I'm just going to monitor the side here because we can't go any further anyways than that full back position there which is actually a hundred anyways so that's absolutely fine. And uh, the limit on the pan, uh, so that the pan um, doesn't touch the Vista, that one is at 84% resolution. 84, which means that even at its extreme, 
it's not hitting the Vista and actually what happens is um, I need to dial this down a bit more as you will see you actually lose the back end of the plane because then this piece here starts to get in the way so we've actually got too much uh, range of motion I guess you could say uh, but you know it's still pretty incredible and then of course this has to go on top of there the wings have got to go on and uh, then we've got to see if it flies also the props got to go on as well this is how the crossfire is set up fairly easily so if I uh, page over and then page over if we go there the protocol CRSF 1 to 16 that's on the external RF make sure the internal RF is turned off then if I turn over the transmitter I'm using the full crossfire so all of the settings are on here can long press the button here and uh, if we go into the Nano RX and then go into output map that's loading you can see that uh, yeah I've got S bus selected and then all the other channels uh, it's output into six but then channel map here uh, will have 12 and I've got the link quality on 12 and if we go to general um, I've got the dynamic profile on you can see that's where you change your channel from 8 to 12 and if I go back into transmitter uh, they've got a head tracker option here I'm not using that don't bother uh, max power output 250 milliwatts just so that it doesn't drain my battery it's absolutely plenty and uh, that's my crossfire setup so as you can see that's the lovely view I get through my goggles with all of the telemetry on there and the battery voltage very useful Be even more useful if I could record it but still very useful compared to nothing okay well let's hope that after all of the blood sweat and tears This thing flies FPV, just taxiing out into wind so the thing doesn't flip over on me. And I'll show you the, the full range of movement that we've got. So I can look back and just about see my elevator and then down the wing for the ailerons. This is a nice shot of the wheels here and same other side you should be able to see so ailerons and currently running on 80% of the pitch angle on the pan uh, just because when this black part of the canopy gets in the way we actually lose field of view you lose the tail uh, there's no point looking back there one thing that is good about this is uh, we can look right above for when we are doing formation flying but uh, moment of truth let's go for a takeoff very quickly in the air straight away I can uh, I can feel the bumps RSSI is good, 99%. Could do with a little bit of trim, which I'm going to do on the radio because I'm flying in manual mode here. It is a dull day, man. It's really dull. Uh, but she's flying no. with it being a dull day that's not going to show up too much uh, vibration from the prop 
to wait for a sunny day from that. I have had vibration problems with this prop in the past, but it's okay. And we've got a pond down there. That's into wind and we're practically hovering here. Nice view, eh? Not bad, not bad. Okay, before we do anything else, let's try the uh, GPS modes. So let's take it over here and then go into loiter. Uh, it's quite a sharp turn that it does when it does that. But what's really great about having a, a loiter mode is like, you know, if you have a problem or you feel like, oh, actually I can't make that landing. You know, this is a small patch here. You stick it in loiter mode and we can take the goggles off and we can land it line of sight. Just uh, circling above me where I am here. And that is, uh, that's on the limit, that is, that's, that's 400 foot. Trying to be mindful that you guys have got to <laughs> watch this back, so I'm trying not to do any sudden head movements. It's hard though, because if any of you, will we'll come out of that mode. If any of you have ever done VR, you will know that uh, the thing is so immersive that you will not care how much you are moving your head. You're moving your head the amount that you want to move it. And uh, it doesn't make for a very good YouTube video. Okay, let's... Uh, Let's do, let's do some aerobatics because I know that's, uh, it's more entertaining than me just flying around here. So uh, let's go for a roll. So pitch up, roll over and back round. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing some jello there for sure on the throttle. A little bit of play uh, in the motor, in the shaft. Yeah, I, I can see that that, that would result in uh, jalo on a sunny day. Why, it's giving me jalo now, so that's something to look at at another time. I was so upset uh, when this one crashed. I didn't crash it. I was testing out a uh, smoke system that I'm working on and um, it blew the back in the flight controller and it was just a horrific crash. My good friend Phil on the channel repaired it. Uh, but even he was like, oh, this is close to not being repairable. It's basically held together with glue now. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit of vibration. Uh, you see when I come down on the throttle, it's kind of always there. Let's go for a bit of inverted flying. This is always weird when you do inverted flying and look to the side. <laughs> yeah, a weird perspective for sure. Now all of the indicators on the screen are like just so super helpful. Like it's, it's very easy to keep 400 feet uh, currently going uh, 30 mile per hour. Uh, I know the thing will do 60 mile per hour from before. It's just such a nice plane to fly. Uh, 
That's me. Down there. Shall we, uh, shall we try and fly between some trees, huh? Just gonna buzz myself. Outer body experience. <laughs> Not off. Okay, this is always a fun one. I remember the first time that I did this. Like people thought I was going to hit the tree because, of course, line of sight, it does look like you're going to hit the tree. So 1.4 meter wings, big wide trees, no problem. Nice tight turn. <laughs> Of course, you have to be careful not to stall with a plane. But uh, these uh, short takeoff and landing planes, yeah. you've got plenty of power to get yourself out of trouble. <laughs> and of course, with the uh, Lion Pack, So uh, not even getting started at 13.8 uh, volts and we've been flying for 10 minutes. Even with me prattling around. See, when you're inverted, you can look up at the ground. Kind of like a, a real pilot can. <laughs> and, you know, it's what I love about the Cub. It, it flies like a real plane. You want to do a roll, you have to gain a little bit of height, you know. It's, you've not got uh, free power like you've got with a lot of RC planes where it's like, in trouble, full power, close your eyes. You actually have to fly it. And uh, it feels, it just feels like, you know, see, we're inverted here. I can shape the rudder to straighten us up. Obviously use the rudder to control it on the ground, but we can also do things like wing overs, just as a, you know, sort of a half knife edge type thing. But what I want to try out is the, is the return to home. Yeah, getting, getting quite a bit of vibration it looks like okay we're just at 300 feet there the wind's blowing like crazy return to home <laughs> it turns so steeply i was talking to some of the i knife guys and uh Apparently it's pretty tricky to not get it do that. So that's where it took off from and it's just going to fly sort of like roughly near there and then turn us around. And that is the return to home. It just loiters when it gets there. But that's great to have because, you know, if I lose video for whatever reason, uh, then I can just flick that, take the goggles off and, and land it. Line of sight. <laughs> great shot in it. You can also like stick it in these modes as well. So if I uh, just straighten out, we'll go over there, technical navigation term, go over there. <laughs> and uh, if we just stick it in lighter mode here, we can just let the plane fly itself if we want to have a cheeky look around, I'll look behind us, look directly up. It's important for us to have the up capabilities because we like to do formation stuff with them. Oh, 
what's interesting is you see that I think that's the foam vibrating because the picture the picture is not vibrating that's interesting isn't it it could just be because it's dull out there but I'm looking at the wheels there hardly anything at all like the other wheel nothing and then the front it might be just from all of the crashes oh, interesting might be just the phone moving because oh, no the whole thing's moving it's not there <laughs> anyways I'm focusing too much on that. Uh, we need to do a landing. So I'm gonna take it out of lighter mode. Do some nice flippity flops. <laughs> That's a crazy shot, isn't it? And uh, we are into wind here, so we should be fine. Oh, I love that. Do a four point roll. One, two, three, four. <laughs> so to lose a little bit of height. That's 14 minute flight time. Just think, like, you know, if you wanted to, how far you could go. You know, I've done this a few times now, but. Uh, it's it's still like a wow factor when you do this. I'm literally inverted, uh, looking at myself there. Here's the cows. They are well used to this kind of thing now. I love the extra resolution, being able to pan all the way back. That's a great shot. Uh, my question is what tree do I decide to come under? Let's, let's go for this one. Oh, we got plenty in the tank, so if I screw it up, that is fine. Try not to land the plane, and it lands anyways. <laughs> How about that? How about that? Super air. You want to build one? Best thing that you can do for yourself, honestly. Uh, it's fighting against the wind. Do you know what? Let's go for another circuit. Why not? Why not? <laughs> it just takes off so nicely. Yeah, I think our battery's only got probably another circuit in it. <laughs> Okay, let's try this tree this time. Mm, nah, nah, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it, I think the wind wants us to go as close to this tree as possible. <laughs> oh, bit of wind kicked in there. Don't land the plane, don't land the plane, and it lands. <laughs> love it, absolutely love it. Well, there you go. That is my video on how to build the ultimate RC toy plane. I don't think anyone, no, I don't think anyone's uh, beating us here. Thanks to my friend Phil who, you know, he had the idea of, of doing all this. Uh, I'll put as many links in the description as I can uh, how to do this and get the parts yourself. There you go. As always, thanks so much for watching. Please continue to subscribe. Cheers.